Hype Session with the Hype Magazine. I'm your editor-in-chief, Jerry Doby. And today, 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 I've got this young dynamo by the name of Mark McKay. He has been earning supporters from Nashville to Colorado. He's been on stage with everybody, the cat, uncle, and dog. And the brother is breaking out, kicking behind with his country-tinged rock. He's got layers and depth. He's an actual musician. He's not just standing in front of a microphone. Really enjoyed his brand new single, uh, Dreaming in Color. It's a great metaphor. And the story behind it is crazy. When I ask people about their wildest music creation moments, this story is one of those that go, you got inspired by that. Wow. And look at what we have. Dynamic, dynamic. Mark McKay, welcome, brother. Hey, Jerry. Thanks for having me, man. Stoked to be here with you. Man, stoked to have you. Stoked to have you. So look, some of us are just getting to know you. Uh, we know that you're on the Universal uh, label and it's administered through Bungalow and all that. And uh, you've had some, some great coverage. People are interested. We're looking at the pictures, the concert footage and the photos. I'm like, you've got to mesmerize and leaning forward. So from the inside looking out, talk to me about Mark McKay, the musician. Um, well, yeah, that's a, that's a uh, that's a that's a great lead in there. You know, it's funny. I was I was just having this conversation in the studio last night that, you know, we were. I, I have such an organic story about how this all started. You know, when I, when I first hit the road, it was like I just thought that you write as many songs as you can and you play in bars and you know one day maybe you get good enough to get famous. You know, I thought that was the I thought that was the the deal. And so we have this very sort of old school story where we just started playing in these bars in Los Angeles. And that led into playing. Eventually, we were good enough that we could play in casinos. And then we were good enough that an agent noticed us and let us open for somebody. And then a festival came and it's just been this gradual thing. That being said, it's all been such a whirlwind because mm -hmm. we, we try to hammer the road and we just, you know, at the same time, we're writing and recording and, and trying all this stuff. I was just saying that all of a sudden, and you know, part of that is probably the universal deal happening last year, but you know, all of a sudden here we are, you can feel all these parts starting to come together. And it's just, I could never have scripted it. You know, the music just gets a little stronger. The crowds start to understand what you're doing better. You know, they've seen you a couple of times. They start to latch on to your personal story a little bit. It's just, it's a really wonderful time. It's, it's, it's just very exciting right now because you can just feel it all kind of starting to hit. Hmm. Now, was there a benchmark moment that music said, you belong to me? Come here, boy. Let's get it. Well, yeah. And, and, and yeah, um, I'll, I'll keep the story as brief as I can. But but I, I had done it. I was working in a different industry for a little while, like out of college. I worked in the ski and snowboard industry, but I had been playing guitar and piano since I was like nine years old. And so there was this period of time in my life where I never touched an instrument at all. Um and then one day I was I was actually working for this medical device company. And oddly enough, I was in Hawaii on a paddleboard and uh, I was just taking a, taking the morning off. And it was like I was out there paddling with the dolphins. I know this sounds like a scene out of a romantic comedy, you know, but it was like I was out there in the water. And, and it hit me that if I didn't if I didn't go for it in music and try you know, starting to write songs again and do stuff that I would severely regret it, you know, and I just records were starting to speak to me again. I was like listening attentively more to music and what was happening. And I was having lots of ideas to write songs and I just hung it all up that day. I, I quit my job and I enrolled in music school. And that was the, that was, that was the day that I realized that uh, if I was willing to give all that stuff up, I knew that music was pulling at me stronger than it should be, you know? Wow. Talk about leap of faith. <laughs> yeah. Hey boss, I'm done. No, 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 no two week notice. I'm I'm out. I'm I'm gonna go play my. It was it was pretty reckless, man. I I was like the the reason I made the romantic comedy joke is like I I distinctly remember walking up the beach with my paddleboard and the guy said, "All right, man, did you have fun, you know." And I said, "Actually, can you just set that down for a second, man? I think I'm gonna keep it the rest of the day, you know." And I pulled, I grabbed my phone, I just called everybody. I called my job, I called my apartment, I I, call, I told everybody, you know, I just said I'm out, I'm out of everything. And uh, my next call was to music school in Hollywood, because I didn't really know what I was doing, but I knew they could probably, you know, point me in the right direction. <laughs> I, I understand. I understand. Well, you know, you've been electrifying audiences on stages everywhere across the nation, the festivals and such. I'm an REO Speedwagon fan. So the fact that you got an opportunity 
uh, to share yeah. a stage or open for yeah. Ario Speedwagon. I'm like, God, the, my yeah. camera would have been clickety, 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 clickety backstage. It would have been ridiculous. You know, Richie Sambora, which gives you another layer of the onion that you've peeled. You know, Blake Sheldon, of course, we see him weekly uh, on television. And Tim McGraw, amazing, amazing cat. I don't like his hat selection, but he's <laughs> he's he's good. He's a good artist. You're a workhorse, bro. Like, you, you're you out on tour now uh, until August, right? Talk to me about the road and the grind. You know, I feel like th- every artist is moved by something else, whether it's, you know, some guys – some some artists it's about singing into the camera for social media and and not that that isn't for me by any stretch but i i am just i'm a total road guy i'm everything about if you listen to the songs and the lyrics you'll hear that all of them come to me from just being out on the road driving stuff seeing stuff get, going into these communities all over the country and trying the local restaurants and and playing these new venues and and meeting these appreciative music fans that are so grateful when somebody comes to their town to play I just, if you ever took, if the road ever went away from me, knock on wood, I don't think I could, I don't think there would be any interest for me. I just, I have to stay busy. I'm totally addicted to the grind of like, you know, you like we did that, like a good example is that REO Speedwagon run or a lot of these rock guys where we've gone out for, for longer periods of time, you know, you, you, we would play, we would sound check, we would do a meet and greet, we would get dinner, I would go in the shower and get ready. I'd play the show, I'd hang out with people at the merch booth, and then we were in the car for eight hours to get to the next town, to go to sleep by five in the morning so you could get up at noon and do it again the next day. And I just, I I wouldn't trade anything for that. You know, that sounds amazing. I remember, you know, and it's not my conversation, it's it's about you, but I started out early on in my career as a street teamer. I had a street team. So at all the car shows, hanging posters, Destroying cities got fined in Vegas for vandalism yeah. because I hung too many posters. We had to get the cherry picker. And so that was $1,500 per poster. Wow. Yeah, the label was not happy with me, Jack. But I'm like, but this is what you paid me to do is going to tear it apart. So the grind, I remember doing what we did, uh, 22 cities in 28 days behind the lowrider car show. And so when you talk about getting in and driving. I'm like, oh my God, falling asleep at the wheel, trying to get a, a little shut eye at the rest stop. You know what I mean? And yeah, living out of the I hear it, man. So crazy. But I love your work. So the first joint that I met Mark McKay under was meant for this, which was the previous single before uh living in yeah. Memphis. It, yeah. It, you know, real rich little braggadocious, but also kind of that standing naked in front of the mirror moment. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not an imposter. This, I really am meant for this. This is like air for me. I got to have it. And then here we come with this change of timbre, you know, a little more deep, more bottom in on Dreaming in Color. It's really lush, really lush. And give the guitar an opportunity to shine, and then you're you're a low tenor, uh, maybe high baritone. Yeah, in that in that range, right? And yeah. So it just melds so freaking well, bro. Talk to me Thanks, about dude. the creation of Dreaming in Color, and tell the story about you know, yeah, how that, how that came to be. That's so yeah. Funny. Well, I wrote Dreaming in Color with one of my best friends in the world. Uh, his name's CJ Solar. We, we've been friends for years. He's a hit songwriter in Nashville. And um, he, he tends, he's, his, his hits have been with very, very mainstream country artists. But he's a Southern rock guy. And we have always seen, musically, we're like, we're like twin brothers. You know, we just love that. We love guitar-driven, anthemic, real rock and roll songs that have a chorus. That's the catch, right? And so we we get together one day, and actually, I have a I don't have it behind me here, but I have this high string acoustic guitar, and so we were sitting here in the studio, and I said, "Here, why don't you uh, why don't you play this?" You know, and and so all of a sudden, it was like it was it, it was actually a songwriting lesson, and how a lot of times the 
the, the guitar you're using can really influence the song because the riff that that basic strum chord that you hear on Dreaming in Color was played on that guitar. And, and, and had we had a different guitar in our hand, I don't think that same story, that same sound would have come. And then as far as the song, we had seen this documentary that was about how some people without realizing it can only dream in black and white. And uh, we, we just thought that was so just so interesting. I, I don't want to say crazy because it's it's kind of a, a reality in, in some ways, but it's kind of one of those things that you don't always don't always think about. So we started playing that riff and trying to come up with some words. And then and then all of a sudden the idea of, you know, dreaming in color. I think I, I, he had a title or I had had that title written down or something. And then it all kind of made sense. And we were able to craft quite a beautiful song out of it. It's amazing. I, I when I listened to the song and then I heard, you know, I read the explanation. I was like, well, it's, it's kind of a metaphor for not living in the box, not yeah. going with the black and white written word yeah. rules. Yeah. Let me dream and call. I can be an around the corner thinker and it's OK. Totally. And, so kind of beautiful, beautiful joint, bro. And, and yeah. maybe you can think of it as a metaphor, but yeah, I'm an old hip hop head and I'm going, that's a freaking bar right there. You know, that's a yeah. metaphor. That's an impact statement. And, and no, and I, th- oh, I, we, we totally, we were totally thinking about that uh, in, in writing it. And, and I, and I appreciate that you noticed that metaphor because it's so, it's so obviously there, you know, I think that's the beauty of great songs, you know, is like sometimes you craft a song to tell a sort of very specific moment um, because it, it makes the hook pay off better or it makes the song more commercial for a dumber thing to say. Hmm. But there's so there, it's such a bigger, it's such a bigger picture beyond that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, this is the lead up and I don't know, you have a title, I don't have the update, but you, you're, it's leading to a, a new album. Is yep. it, it'll be your debut full length, right? Yep. No. Do we do we have yep. a title or is it still G sixteen classified right now? We don't because yeah we we don't and part of that is that I listen to the body of work that it is almost finished and I and I can't figure out whether it's named after something else or it's named after one of those songs or it's just a self titled record. I I I almost feel like it's crazy for. And I bet I bet other artists would say the same thing. But we've played over a thousand shows around the United States. We've played with with the biggest rock acts, the biggest country acts for, you know, sometimes thirty five thousand people out there. And and like I said earlier, you know, I just I feel like just in the last, you know, a little bit, Mark McKay as the artist is sort of proud to say this is who I am. And I and I, I it's very it's very like um I don't know what the word is. It's very exciting to say that out loud. You know what I mean? And I and I I almost wonder if this is the moment. And I, obviously these these have to be label conversations too. You know, but I almost wonder if this is the moment that we put out the Mark McKay self titled release. I know sometimes that's the first record, but sometimes it's just when your career finally starts to make sense to you. You know what I mean? I, I like the way you tied in. Like it's you finally met yourself. You know what I mean? I'm from LA. Yeah. So yeah. Fast pace, <laughs> moving, et cetera, et cetera. I'm yeah, out here in Kansas City, I met myself again here, slowed down, able to think, boom, boom, boom. Do you think this would be like Mark McKay early essentials as far as the body of work? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's funny, like we every time an artist goes into the studio and you record something new, 99.9% of the time you hear it coming off the speakers and you go, this is the best thing we've ever done. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then you go back and you work on it a month later and you think, yeah, this is really good. And then it gets mixed and it goes into the public's hands, goes into the label's hands. It goes to your agent. It goes to the people around you. And you sometimes realize maybe, maybe it's not as strong as I thought it was, or maybe, mm-hmm. maybe it was, you know, I, and I, and I, and I, I I'm not trying to be a downer about the music process. I'm just saying the reality is we all get so excited about something new. It's shiny. It's new. And then, and then it comes into reality in time and you, and, and, you know, there's some people that hear it and just go, I don't like it as much as the last song. Hey, whatever. That's their opinion. It's about what I like. Right. That being said with this new music that we've done, I came out of the studio and I thought, I think we did something spectacular on this new batch of songs. And my producer, Adam, who 
co-produced all my stuff with me. He texted me a few days after and he said, hey man, you know, I, I've made some massive records in this room and nothing has ever sounded as good as this. And, and, and I deliberately took two months between initially recording and going back to revisit the vocals and, and some overdubs and stuff just to let the dust clear instead of, you know, doing it all in a quicker. And I, man, I've been in there the last few days just going, I, I can't believe how good this stuff is. I still think it, you know? So I think we've, I just feel like we're at one of those points where, where something exciting is about to happen and you can feel it, you know? I, I, I don't consider myself to be an expert at rock music or country music. Um, <clears throat> but I'm a lover of music and my mother was a concert pianist. So I'm really picky. You know yeah. what I mean? Really yeah. picky. I lived my early life in the concert halls around the country as she was recital after recital and accompaniment after accompaniment. You make beautiful music, bro. It's complete. The production is complete. The musicality, you know, between the voice, timbre, intonation, spacing, timing, all of it comes together. You know, they say, oh, he's in the pocket. No, the pocket is surrounding him. You're leading uh -huh. the production. Kind of like the lead dancer is just that millisecond ahead of everybody on Broadway yeah. on these huge productions. <laughs> I love it as a, as a person. So... Uh, I know that you're you're busy. I really appreciate the time. I want to respect. I know that uh, coming up on this tour, like I said, it goes to August fifteenth. So far, I'm sure they're they're routing you more. Uh, April twenty sixth, Pleasant Hill, California. He's at Wise Girl Live Music Venue, and then directly after that, Lucky New Orleans and Lucky Louisiana. He's new New Orleans and Shreveport, May 9th and tenth, with Dwight Yoakam. Bro. Can't wait. Direct support for Dwight Yoko. I don't know if that means you were requested or demanded, but direct support. It, yep, it means I can't wait. <laughs> Congratulations on all your success, bro. I, I really, oh, okay. I can't help this one. Reno Philharmonic Orchestra. Yeah. We've been watching the hip hop guys yeah. Do you know the the orchestras? Talk to me about the Philharmonic collab. Yeah, that's that's going to be. I, that, so Reno is actually where I went to college. I was a journalism student at one point. So everything to do with Reno, Nevada, is uh, very special to me. And uh, when they asked me to do it, we're doing kind of a two part show. Sure. Um, we it's in a baseball stadium, and we're going to open the show as a band. And then I'm going to join them for, for a couple, you know, some collaborations. And, uh, you know, I, sometimes some of the music theory stuff that I learned, I wondered if I'd ever use, but let me tell you something, dude, trying to follow orchestra charts. I'm glad that I got an education in music because it just trips me out. <laughs> I can only imagine. I can, I, yeah. my only experience is clarinet in the sixth grade. Right. And I was like 36 years. <laughs> I me too. I think. Against the wall. <laughs> it was oh, get him yeah. away from any microphones. Thank you. Yep. So fun. You, I heard you say journalism student. Yeah. Good. Next question then is: You may have been interviewed, like I said, by everybody at Cat Uncle and Dog. Is there a question we as journalists have neglected to address with you that you might have wanted to answer along this journey? Oh man, I, I don't know that I could think of that on the spot. You know, I um I will say that you've asked great questions, and I'm not just saying that because you're uh, sitting across the camera from me. But I think one of the frustrating things uh, that's that's how I'll answer this question is I think one of the very frustrating things that happens in interviews, in my opinion, is a lot of times everybody asks the same generic question, and us as artists automatically focus on the more frustrating stuff. Uh, that along the way, because we everything about being an artist is it, it is not for the faint of heart, as you know, right? I mean, all of it is a lot of rejection. It's a lot of pouring your heart out to somebody and them not necessarily caring or understanding. And that's fine. It's about me. It's not about somebody else, you know. But when I get a chance to reflect on the 
inspirations of songs, the reason I do it, collaborations with Philharmonic orchestras, that kind of stuff. That's at the end of the day, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning, you know. And I just I wish other I wish other journalists and um and interviews. And some of them are great. I'm not I'm not slamming everybody by any stretch. I've had a lot of great interviews, but I've had a lot of bad ones too. There's times where I'm like, I just wish we couldn't focus on questions that make the artist dive into the negative stuff. Yeah. I'm not into the clickbait or any of that garbage. Yeah. I'm 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 Walter Cronkite-ish with a little bit of Oprah in there, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I want to have fun and have a conversation as opposed to an interview because we can get all the juice out to meet. And yeah, y'all vegans can go to heck. I don't care. I'm gonna <laughs> gonna get all the juice out of the meat in the conversation. That's so funny. I got some friends that just they want me yeah. to change. I'm like, I'm 60, bro. Pork chops is it. That's what's happening. <laughs> Give me my pork chops and my mashed potatoes, a little coleslaw on the side, maybe, and and leave me alone. Go away. Man, I went to, I went to the steakhouse the other night and we did this tomahawk steak and I they Ooh. like table side they like cut it open. I was just like, gosh, just such a unbelievable piece of artwork <laughs> yeah have you ever been to one of the brazilian restaurants where they parade the meat and they're slicing it in front of you and unbelievable. You turn your little thing over to like stop feeding me stop feeding I, me. I know i know it's like you you think you, you think there's such a restaurant where you just can't eat anymore and that's literally where they just let you eat to the point that you can't walk <laughs> awesome last two questions were you a scholarship student in, in college no no then what was your favorite struggle meal your college struggle your go-to like i got taco bell bread right now i don't have you know shea pork chop money uh you know it it was it was a variety of canned soups because you know it's interesting like i i could i couldn't do the raw the, the top ramen thing like something something like grossed me out about that when i was i love like ramen now real ramen you know but yeah, I, I just always remember going like, yeah, like at least I can do one of those like Campbell's chicken soups and I I can like stomach it and be okay with it, you know. <laughs> Something quick. I understand. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Was there anything you wanted to cover that I may have neglected? No, thanks for taking the time to chat with me this morning, man. I appreciate it. Man, I really appreciate it. All right, everybody. Mark McKay, amazing musician, plays piano, guitar. He had a red one that he showed uh, before off camera i thought we might get a riff or two but um his his uh schedule is crazy do you think baby you disappeared the magic guitar my favorite guitar it's what i write all my tunes on these days really yeah what what brand is it it doesn't matter can i, I, can I tell you that can i tell you that story really quickly absolutely okay so this is this is funny so one day i played this this gibson hummingbird guitar mm. acoustic guitar and i thought it was great and so i called my friend at gibson and i said can you get me one of these you know and he said well i probably can't get you one but i've got a loaner you could take for a little bit so i went down and he said we've got this new line of epiphone guitars just take this one and try it out it's one of the lower end models but you know i said i, I kind of like that because i tore so much i hate taking guitars that i'm stressing about you know so anyway i i uh I go uh, play that guitar all over and everybody's losing their mind. I'm writing great songs. Dreaming in Color was written on that song, uh, on that guitar. So anyway, I call him up and I go, hey, man, I, whatever it costs, I, I'll just pay for it. I just want this guitar. And he goes, well, I, I can't really get you a deal because that was this, but I can charge you for it. I go, how much is it? And he goes, $400. And I go, what? I, I thought he was going to say 4000 It's like the best playing guitar ever, you know? Wow. So uh, I said, Really? And he goes, yeah, it's like one of our entry level Epiphone guitars and you could just buy it for $400 anywhere, 399 bucks anywhere or something, you know? So I just got that guitar. It's my, everybody picks it up and goes, man, what year is this thing? I go brand new. Bought it for $400. <laughs> I ain't mad at you. I ain't mad at you. Yeah. All right, everybody. Mark McKay, the new video is out. Dreaming in Color. Go check him out on YouTube. Where else can they find you and, and your website where they can see all the good clips? The website's markmckayofficial.net. Um, McKay is M-A-C-K-A-Y. Uh, and then, you know, you can you can listen to our music anywhere you listen to music. Spotify, Apple, Amazon, wherever. And uh, and yeah, YouTube is is there too. And uh, all, all that links off the website. Instagram's at Mark McKay. You can find me. Dreaming in color. Giving us an opportunity to enjoy life in a vivid 
manner. Instead of being stuck in a box, letting somebody tell you how to think and see things, You're not responsible for looking at it, the world through their eyes, hype, how you perceive everything. Mark McKay, dreaming in color. Throwing an alarm clock in the graveyard, folks. Wake up, and we're out. As an artist, we should reflect the time. Why you so talented? Because I'm black. Why you so amazing? Because I'm black. It's really important that we build characters so that people understand their story matters. Two Chains and I both are just really into good food. And when you know you are royalty, you will only aim in life to be royalty. We're doing it right now. I don't give a damn what they say about me. Yes, I called your ass out. I know I shouldn't be saying this kind of Shout out to Hype Magazine Network. Shout out to the Hype Magazine Network.